Okay, so uh, this is about uh, the history how uh, Linux came to be used in the uh, world of finance. And uh, that's kind of a, a long story. And uh, we're not talking about uh, 70s here. But this is, 70s is of, course, of course used in the finance industry, but these are specialized uh, arrangements that are made to interface with exchanges. So uh, in many ways, uh, Linux is the dominant force today in uh, high performance computing. And that is a, a, actually a different area. And uh, handheld and uh, so we have both the low end and the very high end of uh, computing uh, at mostly 100% uh, here. But it also runs the world of finance these days. And so um, finance uh, it consists of the stock markets where they use uh, Linux to uh, match the trades. And there are special quants out there, investment banks that implement complex trading strategies and try to make money. Uh, either of the customers, the investment banks, or of trading on the stock markets, like the quants do. Um, so uh, then there's this classic stuff like uh, customer relation management, supply chain management, and all the other things. These are also uh, all um, migrated to Linux these days. And so I'm going to talk a bit about the history, why these decisions were made, and how the uh, industry evolved. And so we have a, ver a variety of uh, participants in, these, uh, in the area of finance. There's first of all the stock exchanges. The stock exchanges get fees from the uh, uh, companies who trade on the stock market, and they want to provide an equal playing field for all the investors, so that they all have equal access and equal chance to buy all these symbols. So their interest is not so much in uh, 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 efficient or high-speed trading, but is in, in, in fair trading. Uh, then we have the banks. Uh, the banks uh, uh, do trade for their investment portfolios and on behalf of customers. And uh, their main interest is to get the best price. And you know, typically, the banks have a price differential between what the customer pays and what they pay on the stock market. And they, their interest is to uh, have uh, uh, the most profit on that level. And today, the corporate giants like Google, Facebook, and so on, uh, they all have uh, these days integrated finance operations that also directly interact with the exchanges. And mostly that is used for international trading as well as to preserve the value of their stocks and uh, to uh, manage the wealth that they are accumulating. And managing that with, with banks uh, is something that they wouldn't be doing. They, want, they, don't, they want to have their own departments that, that deal with this. Then we have small investors uh, that have some software on the machines at home. And they interact with the exchange, and they think they have a special trading arrangement. Usually, they have some kind of niche knowledge where they can make money off these things. And their interest is to have uh, uh, fast access to the internet and uh, be competitive with, with the big guys. Then there are professional quants. quants. Those uh, people have uh, a lot of uh, uh, money, and they have sophisticated operations. Usually, they have uh, equipment directly located at the stock exchanges. And they want extremely low, low latencies, and they want to have an uh, edge about everybody else. And so these things, uh, that's, this is a result in a race between all of these to get the best prices. And typically, I think the, the professional quants win because that's where they make the money. And, they, um, and typically, the other ones try to come close to them, but they're not willing to make the investments that the quants do, uh, to, do uh, to get that low latency. So where does this happen? Um, the most important exchanges is Chicago, uh, New York, London, Frankfurt, and uh, Shanghai now. This gets bigger and bigger. Um, so uh, there's no a lot of uh, uh, professional operations starting up here. And a lot of the classic uh, entities from the rest of the world are tr is trying to enter uh, China now and also do these trades here. So how does, actually, does this actually work? Um, if you have a stock exchange, uh, the stock exchange has a matching engine. There are the orders of the buyers and sellers flow together and they are matched. And when that is done, a trade is occurring. And uh, if a trade has occurred, then the, the fact that the, uh, that, the, that, the, that the trade has occurred and how it was, has occurred, as well as the, maybe the change of the value of a stock symbol is spread by the market data distribution mechanism. This is usually a multicast uh, group, 
And so they use the hardware to replicate messages about this information. And the information is sent out to various business entities that then may react to the event, to the change of value or to a trade that they see occurring. And they may send a trade back to the exchange in order to do something else, maybe to make, take a profit now because the value of the symbol has changed. So they have another connection, uh, which is usually TCP based, where they contact as a system on the premises of the stock exchange. And then that's, that front end processor uh, sends the uh, uh, trade of the trader or of the entity to the matching engine and another trade may occur and the whole process starts over and over and over. And this is usually going around all the, the, the day when trading is active. And uh, the, these entities are part of this trading cycle and they are all mutually influencing one another and they drive the value of the symbol back and forth and they are trying to get an advantage out of the uh, mechanisms that are active there. Uh, so, um, and uh, the t technology sophistication of these various entities is different. Uh, and uh, so, because there are different objectives here that they have, and also the, the stock exchange, as I said before. Um, since we are a small group, if you don't want to, if you don't understand something or have a question, just speak up. That may be the best. If I talk too fast, tell me that too. <laughs> okay. Um, so, what kind of technologies are, are being used here? Um, and you need to have intelligence and speed. For intelligence, you can use something like Kubernetes or an HPC cluster to do uh, data processing. Uh, and then you need to add the exchange. You, if you're connected to the exchange and you're in this closed loop, you want to react as fast as possible because you want to have an advantage and catch the uh, chance of making a trade uh, by being faster. So, we have powerful and fast processors. People overclock these things. Sometimes game processor, game uh, rigs are, are used with, with uh, water-cooled processors and very uh, specialized uh, designs. Uh, they usually have very high capacities and a fast LAN. Uh, and also, uh, some people correlate these symbols between multiple exchanges. So they have high-speed wide area connections between different cities where they can get the information faster to the other point and therefore react faster if a symbol changes, for example, in New York, and it affects, will affect something in Chicago. And so uh, what they also do is um, they want to write very efficient code. So typically code is very much stripped down. It's bare metal. It's very limited and just focused on this one purpose, and it's extremely optimized. And so there's a lot of Linux hot rolling going on in that area, uh, and a lot of kernel uh, bypass, direct interface with the hardware, and so and so and such and such to uh, uh, increase the speed and gain an advantage on the other participants in this trading loop. Uh, are you following me? <laughs> okay, so how does this happen? How do we get there? So in the, in the 70s, we had this paper trading. Uh, you had to file, file a form and stuff like that, and uh, everything was going manually uh, via hand symbols on the stock market. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, we had MS-DOS uh, first. Uh, the first PCs came about. Uh, then Novell bought, created the first uh, local area network. And then Sun and proprietary Unixes showed up. And they were used by the stock exchanges as well as by the traders to do the initial trades, which were very slow. And so in the 90s, also, the Tenem system was created. These are specialized dual uh, uh, safe uh, computing systems. Um, that are still being used today in some esoteric configurations because they are very secure. They're traditionally, this was demonstrated at the exhibition by taking a shotgun and firing it into the machine. And that, the machine survived that and was, continue, was able to continue to execute. And with that, they got most, many of the stock exchanges to use the Tenem systems. Um, in the 90s, uh, Microsoft developed uh, new layers in the operating system to facilitate messaging uh, uh, like use in the stock markets. For example, they created a message API for this multicast distribution, for the market data distribution that's used by uh, the uh, um, uh, stock markets. And so Microsoft became a, a good platform to use for, tra for trading. And in, the, in around 2000, uh, the Sun systems and a lot of proprietary Unix systems became very big in the trading area, and they took over. Linux was used at the fringes for some side processing, 
but nobody really trusted um, uh, that Linux could do the job. And there were some fierce discussions and disagreements in the tech departments uh, if you could discussing if a Windows system is better or than Linux and vice versa. And there's histories of whole tech departments being fired because the owners got mad at them and um, a lot of horror stories from that area. But in 2007, 2009, the wars were won by Linux and we saw, we, from that time on, we saw widespread adoption of Linux as the trading OS of choice. Uh, first, this was by the traders that, had, that were able to hot rod their Unixes and they jumped on Linux because they could modify the source code and it could optimize the operating system as needed to be faster. And uh, they, uh, gradually the proprietary Unixes uh, were retreating and around 2017, um, most of the proprietary Unixes were, have been vanished and Windows is relegated to the desktop. And from that point on, nothing changed anymore and we have uh, total domination of the stock markets by, uh, by Linux. So um, the uh, individual traders went first and then the brokers came next because they felt they couldn't compete otherwise. The, the trading funds upgraded and the last ones were the exchanges. It took probably five more years before the exchanges would, my, would move. And that is mostly because uh, they had to make sure, they wanted to uh, be fair to everybody and they were very afraid of doing any changes. And so they gradually introduced the technology and they hardened it and they were very doubtful about this until one or two switched over and then finally the rest felt they couldn't avoid that. And so finally, uh, everybody today is on uh, Linux. So what kind of technologies are we seeing in this area? First of all, the kernel optimizations. A lot of the traders, the quants, they hack the kernel and they do modifications to the various kernel layers that was going on initially. Um, then there are uh, offload APIs in the kernel. This is RDMA API, which allows direct memory to memory transfer between different systems in a network. That was used to reduce the latencies and to avoid the high latency of the network stack. Then some people started using real-time kernels because they felt they were more efficient. Uh, which caused some discussion because in fact actually they're slower. And then the, the term real time was really fine and now we have a different notion of real time in the kernel that actually is faster, but it's not really the uh, academic definition of real time anymore. Um, then they found out they can optimize the binaries as well. So special compilers were being used, handcrafted assembly code in user space. And uh, then there was a discussion about the methods of, uh, of la what languages to use. First, there was Java and use basic even in the earlier phases. And uh, the universal agreement in the industry after all these years is that C++ is the best one because you can load level code in this. And most of the code bases that I know today are now on C++ in, in the industry. There were numerous network enhancements being made. There was a multicast layer added to the kernel and the multicast was uh, very much improved because that's key to market data distribution that's uh, used throughout the industry and everywhere. And so today we have excellent uh, multicast support in the Linux kernel. And what we have recently is um, the general skepticism regarding Linux at all. We don't want any software in between. We want to interact directly with the hardware because that's where we can be fastest. And so there's a tendency these days to just write directly to the hardware. And there are specialized development kits from Intel as well as from the storage companies where you can bypass the kernel and can directly interface with the registers of a device and can bypass all the inefficiencies that you may perceive in the operating system. And one of these problems of the industry is the speed of light problem. You want to be fastest, but there is a physical limitation of how fast you can communicate information. And so um, the uh, problem is here um, that you cannot really go faster than the speed of light. And so there's, there's, a, there's a limit to where you can go. And um, there are various measures to get you closer to that limit. And the closer you go, the more specialized hardware you need, the more uh, sacrifices you may need to make in terms of cost. So there's a, this exponential curve as you go closer to it. And so it always depends on how much money you want to spend to reduce the latency. Um, it takes about uh, hundreds of, of, of milliseconds to send a signal around the Earth. That is, for example, the problem. You cannot simultaneously uh, update things uh, globally. And in 
today the trading cycle of on an exchange is much less than a, a millisecond. So it takes hundreds of milliseconds to go around the globe. So there's a mismatch now between what you can do locally in a very fast way and what, how the signal propagates globally. So there's a huge need of kind of uh, fast communication between various continents because there is a huge time difference. So um, if you can have an advantage prior to somebody else, you can make a lot of money. And so that this led to various optimizations, making the fiber straight, not using fiber at all because fiber is slow, slower than the signal over the air. And there's rumors of people trying to use blimps to uh, bone the signal off it. Some people have been trying to use the moon to bone the signal. <laughs> it's all sorts of weird things. Some people discussing uh, neutrinos to shoot through the earth and detect them on the other side. Um, so there's a lot of adventurous thinking there, but um, some of these uh, esoteric things have never gotten anywhere. So and we have basically a, a, a transition here from manual to automated trading. Um, manual takes hours to arrange, and now we have milliseconds and stuff like that, but this is probably um, too much. So, um, and too slow, I don't have much time left. So the how, uh, why was the Linux used for this? Um, there's a specific dependency of whoever gets there first, so you must be able to control your tech. If you can't control your tech and you use third-party tools and they make a change that will increase the latency, then you suddenly your software broke and you can't use it anymore. So there's a tendency to just have all the software in-house, open source is appreciated, we can see in it, we can modify it, and we can make optimizations. Um, how can you beat the other guy? The other guy is doing the same thing, and so you say, okay, we have more intelligent developers, you have better developers, we will hot rod this thing to the hilt, and we will be faster than you because our guys are great. Um, so that uh, also, and then we have the problems with the high latencies in, 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 the, in the Windows network stack that caused the move to uh, Linux, because uh, there was a, a lot of people analyzed the latencies of trading and they found that they had high latencies in the, in the Windows network stack. They also found high latencies in the Linux network stack. But these guys got active and contributed to the Linux network stack and changed it. So suddenly the Linux network stack was better. And uh, Windows didn't change. So that kind of dynamic caused uh, a pretty uh, uh, energetic move to uh, Linux. And uh, Windows, uh, Microsoft rarely updated that. So after some time frame, the differentiation became a factor of 10 or so and it was not possible anymore for any very reasonable person to use that. So the customizability of, of Linux won out. And the other thing is most internet services these days use Linux. So it's natural to use uh, uh, Linux for the same purpose because you already have all the mechanisms for networking there in a sophisticated way and they are stable because otherwise the Linux uh, systems couldn't be used for web services or for routers, for everything else that's out there. And then we get this uh, adoption of the uh, exchanges of Linux, and which, that's also then caused a lot of uh, hang or left, uh, a lot of companies that were still hanging on to uh, convert the systems to Linux because they saw, okay, the exchanges are doing it, and the, so they feel it's safe, and so I can now also use my Linux systems. And uh, one of the last competitors out there was Sun Solaris, and some of the exchanges held out to the very end for this. Um, but after Oracle was bought uh, Sun, uh, that was a sign for the industry, okay, they lost. They are not profitable anymore, they will be going away. And at that point, we saw the uh, very fast adoption of uh, Linux for the rest of it, and the Sun systems were kicked out very fast because everybody felt they had a liability on their hand and they felt that their systems were no longer stable and could be uh, subverted by any change that Oracle would do any minute now. So the control issue was there. So with Linux, they had control over the source code, they had uh, a reliable operating system, there's nobody who could, could take it over and mess around with it. And there's still some minor uses of AIX and uh, some BSDs in the industry in some niche corners, I think. And uh, I, that may not be going away. But the, the trust that people have of IBM is much higher than they have of Sun. And, <laughs> and BSD is also open source and people also have no control issues with that because you have the source code as well. So this remains. 
So what's being used today in this terms of distributions? Mostly Red Hat Enterprise Linux, sometimes older releases, because older releases have smaller binaries, they fit better in the caches of the CPUs, they run faster. So people are very hesitant to upgrade. And uh, in Europe, uh, the European stock exchanges use uh, SUSE, uh, and uh, then there are various real-time versions of both uh, that are used ma mainly by the exchanges. Some have been using Gen2 because with Gen2, you can recompile your binaries and you can make them smaller. Thus, you have the beneficial caching effects and the binaries will run faster if you just remove all the features that you don't need. And so that this was observed by various uh, exchanges, various companies, and Gen2 is, very, is a favorite of the industry. And then there's Ubuntu and Debian. Um, the reason for that is to evade the commercial entities like Red Hat and SUSE, because at that point, you interact with a large company and you're at the whims of the large company, right? With Ubuntu and Debian, you have a much wider availability of all source code and you have direct influence over the release of it if you can get hold of a maintainer or if you hire a maintainer. So Ubuntu and Debian is prevalent, especially in embedded systems. Uh, uh, Debian is very prevalent. I mean, if you buy, buy a, build a very small system that's dedicated to a certain function, uh, Debian is uh, mainly used. So um, the challenges for Linux and finance, open source uh, contributors are rare. Everybody thinks uh, they have the secret source and it's very valuable and they're not giving it away. So if they hack the Linux kernel, they will first make sure that uh, they can keep that advantage and they don't want to publish it. Um, the technique that I've developed is, uh, okay, let's hold it. But if you see the comp competitors trying to make a move to, to uh, change the Linux kernel on that level, you dump your stuff in there and you show it's better and you, you kill the change that the comp competitor wanted to do because now he needs to change his software and I, I don't, don't need to change your mind. <laughs> um, so uh, the involvement in upstream development is pretty limited um, and uh, most of the developers are constantly seeing regressions in various kernel components that cause high latencies and so people tend to stick to old kernels and use them as long as possible. Um, so that and then resulted to the perception that the operating system is in the way. So the recent development is that, okay, we are going to restrict uh, the kernel to a certain amount of the system. The rest of the system is going to be free of the op operating system. And we're going to write software that directly interacts with the hardware. So we're using DPDK to interact directly with the networking. And we use SPDK to interact directly with the storage. And that way we can remove and by bypass all the operating system layers and can directly go to the hardware. And um, yes, so often they think the overhead, the OS overhead is impinging on the, in an uncontrollable way. So they, they don't know where, where certain latencies come from. And if you have everything under your control, you can avoid that. And actually the, the operating system has been modified these days that you can dedicate certain uh, cores of the OS uh, to trading logic and the OS will stay away from that and will not do anything on these uh, cores. So the cores can be fully used by some direct hardware stuff that you may want to use. That is part of the standard kernels these days. So um, I think uh, you can't get away from Linux anymore in the industry. They are so wedded to the advantages that I don't think any of the classic other platforms will have a chance. There's so much effort and so much brain power accumulated in Linux these days with the Linux networking layer, as well as the bypass uh, uh, mechanisms and everything else, that it is very difficult for an alternate platform to become viable at all. And I think what needs to be done is we need to find some ways to uh, encourage contributions from the financial world to uh, make this more uh, easy for everybody uh, to uh, add their stuff and to actually uh, get more enhancements to the Linux kernel. That was it. Any questions? Any comments? No? Yes. Yes. Um, were they, is that exchange successful in eliminating an arms race? Or do you, or do you know, do you know what, 
what happened next in that story? Like, are they well? Still first of all, the, the book is factually incorrect. Oh, uh, he thinks that somebody uh, front run, ran him. No, there are very intelligent systems on, systems on on the network that observe all trading participants, and he traded every day at ten o'clock. And the system knew that after a couple of times that he always trades at 10 o'clock and, and it prepared the market for him so that he had the most, most expensive thing at that point. So uh, he got paranoid about uh, a neural network that observed him. <laughs> and he was suspecting that people had advantages of him, but I don't think he got the, the thing right. He, he was an investment banker. And typically investment bankers think they can do what the traders, what the quants do, but the credit funds know much more than they do. And so this was written by a banker. And he had some limited knowledge on what was going on. Uh, the, the, he then started this exchange, yes. But um, some people figured out that this can be actually be taken more advantage of than the regular <laughs> stuff if you right. do the right thing. Because right. if you adapt to the intervals, you can still pre-stack the order book in such a way that you get an advantage. Huh. Wow. So the arms race is still there. You just have to modify it a bit. Any other questions? Yeah, you just mentioned that uh, the financial company IT people stick to the old uh, kernel. So uh, I'm just wondering uh, how they solve their uh, security issues because as you know, most of uh, uh, latest kernel has the uh, many uh, important uh, security patches. So if they just stick to the old uh, kernel and usually, and do they uh, backport the security patches by themselves? No. Or they don't care about that because uh, the uh, this, this trading cycle that I showed here, uh, where is it? Jam, jam, jam. In the beginning, there. This whole cycle is in a private world where the public cannot access. This is highly regulated, and uh, these guys pay a lot of money and uh, for this, and none of this is accessible from the internet. So uh, the exposure to risk is very low. Okay. And at that, this boundary, the exchange as well as the traders, they protocol everything that's going on. So if anything goes untowards, they can figure it out and they can, they can debug it, but they will not impinge the performance of the systems. Okay, <laughs> okay thank you. <laughs> so. Anything else? Uh, then thank you for coming. And um, if you want to talk with me afterwards, I'm still here for the next 15 minutes or so. Okay.